Well, hi guys. Thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry and this video about working with rough sawn textures on furniture grade projects. This video is a bit of an experiment for me here at Next Level Carpentry in producing videos that are content rich and possibly production poor because I'll spend more time focusing on the work itself and less time stressing about streamlined video production and fancy editing. And with that in mind, I'll label videos like this as a rough cut production that'll show up in the video thumbnail and videos like this will be included in a different playlist on the channel. And I hope viewers will notice that the videos still have rich content, although video production won't be quite as slick and streamlined as in other video productions here on the channel. What you see here are parts for a massive bunk bed build that I'm doing for a client and I've got all the joinery and pre-assembly taken care of, but I need to clean up the roughs on texture and because this is like framing lumber, there's scuff marks from delivery, there's always these burn or tar marks on roughs on cedar and there's some inconsistencies in the appearance of this material that I want to clean up because, as I said, this is a furniture grade project and not a deck or a pole barn or something. So I want to get this stuff cleaned up. And to do that, I'm using some different techniques that I developed to clean up the surface, to remove those blemishes and make the finished uh, rough sawn texture a little more consistent. And I'll start with some low hanging fruit by showing how I clean up a board that's in pretty decent shape already. These pieces here, some of you might recognize from my video about drilling long holes through lumber, which is what that is. Uh, and these pieces are the cross members from the head frames from the bunk beds. And uh, I've got these four taken apart here so that I can get the texture cleaned up, even though it's not as necessary on some of these pieces as it is on a piece like this. But the tools in the process are kind of the same. So I'm going to go through that. You can see on this first piece here that it needs little or nothing in the way of cleanup. But this is the finish that I'm trying to work towards so it's a little more consistent and uniform on the rest of the pieces because they all vary a little bit just on the nature of the wood. There's plenty of different ways for getting this done but because of the volume of surface that I need to do here on all the parts for both bunk beds, I did a little bit of digging and research and came up with this tool and it's called a Restore. This one is from Eastwood. Uh, Makita makes one and there's other kind of knockoff brands that make smaller kind of DIY versions of the tool. But I chose this one because of uh, its maneuverability and its adaptability. Uh, Makita's got a great machine that I'll link on the Amazon page if you're interested in it. But that would be mainly, in my opinion, that would be mainly for doing large volumes of flat pieces. But with the 4x4s and the configurations here, I wanted a little more maneuverability, which I can get with this tool right here. And one of the features this has that some of them don't is variable speed, which I thought was really important because it's pretty easy to, to over rev something. And I want to be able to dial the speed way down. And all the work I'm doing on these pieces here is on the lowest speed setting on the number one out of like six, I think. But basically it's got a, a stiff wire wheel on here which you can see. And um, another feature of this tool is that you can put different heads on there. Most of them are like a, a scotch brite pad for working on metal. But this particular one uh, does work good for removing rust on metal, but it also works great uh, for digging out soft grain on a piece like this. And cedar has uh, the growth rings in cedar. They're, they're hard and soft like on most wood, but not all. And this does a great job of pulling the softwood out and kind of enhancing the rough sawn texture uh, that, that comes on these pieces. Now, if every piece on the project was like this, I wouldn't even be doing this process because this is a nice look. That's what the, uh, the client wants. And basically, I would just clean this up a little bit with some sandpaper and call it good. But because I've got such a variety of different surface conditions to deal with and I want a little more uniformity, um, but more important than uniformity, I want it clean. I don't want those smudge marks on there, uh, even though a wide variety in the actual texture itself is just fine. So I will start by uh, just doing a close up so you can see how this machine works on a piece like this. Uh, one thing you'll see me doing uh, when I start, I won't start right at the end of the piece because as this wheel spins, it will pull itself into the work 
and it grabs sharp corners like nobody's business. So I'll, I'll work from this end of the piece and bring the tool off the end and then I'll flip the piece end for end uh, so that the wheel is always turning off of the sharp edge so it doesn't grab it and kind of mess it up. Um, you can see here I've just taken a piece of plywood and screwed some cleats on it so that it holds this piece relatively uh, firmly in position and this way I can work on the whole surface and flip the piece around without having to clamp and reclamp for every different position. So here's what this looks like and I'm wearing earplugs while I'm doing this even though the tool isn't obnoxiously loud and when I'm doing large volumes of this I've got to wear a dust mask because this does get pretty dusty and as you can see there's no dust collection port on this tool. Other brands like the Makita and some of the DIY versions have a built-in dust port which would be a nice feature but not at the expense of function of the tool. You'll hear when I trigger the tool on and off that it has a soft start feature which is really nice because this wire drum does have some pull to it. And the soft start makes it easier to manage and handle in use. And I ran that sequence in real time so you can see that that really is all it takes to clean up the entire surface of this particular rail. Removing burnish marks, pencil marks, and scrapes, etc. for a nice, even, consistent rough sawn texture. If I was just cleaning up this texture for rough sawn surfaces like a deck or a, a fence or something, um, I can get a nice consistent finish. But because this is a part of a bunk bed, I want to have that rough texture but kind of minimize the uh, splintering effect. So I'm going to do two more steps on this piece and on all the surfaces for the bunk bed to remove some of the splinters that are inherent in that rough sawn grain and the ones that are raised by that wire wheel in reestablishing or enhancing the texture. And the first thing I do is take a very sharp 36 grit sandpaper on a sanding block and just kind of give the surface a once over and that'll remove the fine splinters that are sticking up like hairs on this piece of wood right now. And again, this is a quick and easy step to help prepare this rough sawn surface for a piece of furniture. And I think you can see the loose splinters that kind of accumulate on the surface when that sandpaper takes them away. And I'm a little cautious about rubbing my hand like this, but it's already pretty much splinter free and proud. I neglected to push the record button on the camera the other day when I was shooting this sequence on other pieces where I was working on this texture. So I fired up the camera today to show you this important step now. The second thing I do after using the Restore and Sharp 36 grit sandpaper is to scrape the rough sawn surface with a sharpened putty knife. This extra step will remove more of the fine slivers that might remain there after using these other more aggressive methods for enhancing that rough sawn texture. And I just drag that sharpened putty knife diagonally the long way across the grain. And you might be able to see the fine slivers that I'm scraping off with this step. It's quick and easy and the end result is a lot more user friendly for the little effort that it takes. Because I know viewers are going to ask, I'll take a minute here to show you how I sharpen a putty knife to use for the scraping process. I just clamp this smooth six inch file in my bench habit to hold it firmly in place. Then I stand the putty knife up on edge as perpendicular as I can get it and drag it a few strokes across the file going both directions on the edge. And on any putty knife that's tuned up, this is really all it takes to raise a nice sharp burr on the edge of both faces of the putty knife. And the burrs on this putty knife work just like the burrs on a card scraper, except they're much faster to establish. So I can work quickly and efficiently to scrape those fine splinters off the face of the board. And there it is then. Now I can advance to the next step in making these rough sawn cross members a little more civilized. So that's the general process that I use on every rough sawn surface on the entire bunk bed project. And once I'm done with that cleanup and retexturing, I switch to a router. Here I'm just using a little Bosch Colt with a 3 16 inch round over bit. And I'm going to knock down these corners because those are the the user surfaces when it's on the bunk bed, when the bed's being made and moving around. Um, I'm going to knock down those sharp corners and because the top surface uh, might, uh, an arm might rest there or a leg rest there getting in and out of the bed, we chose to just leave this uh, smooth plain surface rather than texturing it. 
I certainly could have textured it, but uh, for user friendliness, we decided to just leave it smooth. So I'm going to knock the four corners down with this router to clean this up. And that's all there is to that. The last step for each user contact surface is to use sharp 150 grit sandpaper on a sanding block to kind of dress up plain edges and make them smoother to the touch. And this sanding step also removes any smudges or scuff marks left from the process of making these pieces. And takes just a few seconds to get perfect results. Like I said before, if every piece looked as nice as this one did, when I started, uh, I'd have a lot less work to do and probably wouldn't even be doing this video. But the reality is that they're not all like that. And some of them have uh, more issues to deal with. Everyone that saw the drilling long holes in boards video, there's a link to it here, remembers that I had to cut these pieces in half and glue them back together. And on this particular piece, you can see the glue line in here. And that's mostly because of the wide, flat texture on the face of this board. So I'm going to use the same technique I used at the end of that video to start out the retexturing process of this. And that is to use a cheap big box handsaw to kind of scrape out and blend that glue line. And here I'm using Smurf gloves so I can hang on to this saw. And then I'm just bowing the blade slightly and then using a dragging motion right on that glue line to kind of even up the surfaces, remove that little bit of glue and to establish or re-establish the rough sawn texture on the surface of the piece. Here's a close-up. You can see the glue line here. Before I do this, and that glue line pretty much disappears and blends with a few strokes of the saw like that. And note that I vary the amount of bow in the saw and the angle that I'm dragging this on to kind of mix up uh, what that texture looks like and also to get in little places to make sure everything is cleaned up and retextured. And I'm going to call that good for this step of the process because the glue line has disappeared and the texture is restored. And now that the glue line's gone, I'll just use the same sequence as I did on the other board to make the overall texture and finish of this piece consistent with the other one. And that's pretty much that. Uh, I didn't mention it earlier or anything because it doesn't really pertain to the video, but I did plane the inside of all these surfaces, uh, plane the rough sawn texture off so that they're nice and smooth because that's where uh, bed sheets get tucked in and I didn't want splinters down in there. And these surfaces on the outside, even though they're exposed, they don't really get that much use or traffic or rubbing. So we're not concerned about splinters being a problem for user friendliness of these bunks over time. All right, this next piece here uh, is an example. It's kind of a cross between the first two. It's kind of a rougher texture. And what I want to clean up here is basically this tar mark. I'm not quite sure what that is. Uh, there's kind of a gouge here that doesn't fit with the rest of it. And I don't know if it'll show up, but there's a little bit of a impression here from some kind of a feed roller at the mill. And I want to uh, even up that, make it a little more consistent. But the whole process is pretty simple with these tools. And I'll take my first attempt uh, with the restorer tool and see if that brown will come out of there and see if it'll remove those, uh, those tire marks in here. If not, I'll, uh, I'll resort to the handsaw to kind of uh, tear that out and, and proceed. But we'll see how this goes. And you can see that that tire mark wasn't even a challenge for this machine. And it also makes quick work of removing the drive roller marks in the face of this particular board. 
And with those blemishes so quickly and easily removed, I follow up with the sanding, scraping, and routing steps as before. And there's another piece that is D-U-N, done. On this fourth piece, I wanted to show you uh, these, these uh, drive roller traction marks. I don't know if you can see that. Let's try this. Maybe you can see that there's these little squares. Looks like a waffle grid in there, or tire tracks. And those are deeper than on that last board. So I'll start off with the handsaw to kind of cut those out of there to make sure that I'm not just uh, texturing those marks, but I remove them first and, uh, and then do the texturing process. So let's see what this process looks like. And this is good. You can clearly see those drive roller marks in this area here. They're really pressed down into that wood. And it's interesting because they really don't exist on the other side. So I'm guessing this edge of the piece is thicker maybe, or there was something under it that, that made those drive rollers put more pressure on there. But uh, it's basically no challenge for this technique. And notice I'm standing the saw almost on edge as if I'm cutting rather than dragging the teeth like this. And that gives me a little more directed and focused cut than something's more passive like holding the teeth on the side like that. And there's still a little of that texture remaining. I'm going to try flipping the board end for end and going at it from the other direction, see if that makes a difference. You can still see a faint marking on there. At least I can. I'm not sure if it shows up in the camera, but I think that's close enough to advance to the next step. So let's see what the wire brush on the restorer does to it at this point. I can still see a little bit of a shadow of those marks in there, and I think that's probably the wood being stained and not actually imprinted. But I'm going to give it another pass going the opposite direction with the restorer and see if I can get that out of there a little bit more. While I'm making this pass with the Eastwood Restorer, I'll tell you that price-wise, it's in about the middle of the road for the price range of this sort of tool. With the DIY versions being around 100 or 120 bucks and the Makita over 600, this Eastwood model came in at around 250, give or take, because the tool comes standard with a Scotch-Brite wheel on it. And I wanted this wire brush for this work. And it seems like the wire brush drum was about 50 bucks on its own. And as you expect, there's a link in the video description to an Amazon page where I'll have this restorer tool and its accessories listed along with the DIY version and the Makita as well. So that you can see the range of tools that I had to select from. And I'm just going to stop there on this piece. Uh, I'd say I've got about 95% or a little more out of there. Uh, but the, what remains of that tire track is uh, stained wood and I could keep going and grind down until I got it out of there but I don't want to take off a sixteenth of an inch or an eighth inch of material to get there and I believe that even if that's noticeable it'll fade over time and become a moot point. So there's a bit of insight in what it takes to remove that sort of mark from a rough sawn piece of lumber. I took a bit of a detour after uh, cleaning up the texture on those shorter cross member pieces to build some other components for the bunk bed, like these rabbited filler panels. Uh, they go down underneath on the head frames, um, underneath the stairs, and they cover up the ends of the drawers, which I also built during this little interim. These two sections here are the drawer units that go underneath the lower bunk. They've got oversized drawers in them. This drawer is big enough to uh, handy, handle a carry-on suitcase that can be just dropped in here and opened up. And they even have self-closed hardware on them. Uh, the drawer fronts were made from a continuous piece that was made up of three separate pieces of this cedar that were glued together. So that flows across the whole bottom of the bunk. And also while I was on the detour, I made 
uh, the stairs that lead up to the upper bunk. Uh, these are uh, kind of like a housed stringer with mortise and tenon on the steps. And then one key feature is that these will hinge up uh, in the final installation uh, to allow for cleaning underneath the stairs in the little cubby between the bunks. But now that I've got that stuff done, uh, I'm going to do some of the more serious cleanup work uh, on these head frames. You can see how uh, tough these, vertic these posts here are as far as smudges and uh, this post over here, the texture is pretty smooth. It doesn't go with the rest of it. So I'm going to get this stuff moved out of the way and dig deep for texturing these guys. These head frames are every bit as heavy as, and awkward as they look, but by putting a piece of a carpet scrap underneath the corners here, uh, they are manageable. I can just slide them around like this. and easily maneuver them into place at a nice working height. <laughs> right. This doesn't really have anything directly uh, to do with the texturing, but before I take these frames apart, I'm going to use a piece of half inch material and draw a little line around these tenons. That'll serve as a guide for an upcoming step. And it's just a lot easier to do that now than to figure it out later. And while this is laying here, I'll show you how I've got this thing all put together. Uh, patrons got to see how to make how I made these saddle notches in here and these big tenons uh, on the end of these cross pieces, and also how I drilled holes through here. But I'll show you how these bolts look as I take this thing apart. I've got one 5 16 inch bolt going through uh, each of these assemblies, and there's just a nut on the bottom. I'll take off like that. And then that 5 16 bolt just comes out. And all this does is uh, pinch uh, this um, saddle joint here on the tenon. It's not really much structure, structural strength, and so I didn't think it was necessary to put two bolts in there. And naturally, I've got the same setup on this other side. And the wood's twisting a little bit since I put these in here, so. Sometimes they're a little tough to get in and out. But for the most part, that takes care of that. And with those bolts out of there, just use a rubber mallet and lift that top cross member out. And I just put markings on those pieces so that when I'm putting this back together in Montana, I know what goes where. I better put this aside. And as long as I'm off on this rabbit trail, I'll show you how these cross members come out. And this was the whole uh, thing behind drilling perfect holes through long boards. Uh, I've got a piece of half inch ready rod or all thread going through there. A uh, uh, big nut on this side. Actually, a nut on both sides. It comes right off of there. And you can see that all I got to do is slip this rod out of here, and that will uh, disconnect the two sides. Still a couple washers stuck in there, but there's nothing to it. That piece comes right out of there. And these pieces have labeling them on them too, so I know where they come from and go to when it's all said and done. And then this cross member will get cleaned up in the same fashion as those ones I did earlier. And that second piece of rod is all that's holding this together. Just like that. So two mega bolts and two little bolts hold this whole head frame together. And once this thing's all assembled, um, it's, uh, what was the term I used, bomb proof? And even though I'm doing more editing on this video than I anticipated, uh, this is still kind of a rough cut format in my mind because I'm just kind of figuring this, thing, this video out on the fly. So I'm going to get into doing some texturing on this post now. 
All right, well, I got uh, the victim, I mean, uh, patient on the operating table here, and I'll show you what's going on with this post. Uh, up close, one of the main things that uh, I decided for the look of this was to uh, ease the corners on this. Uh, most of the corners are pretty good, but a couple of these posts had big dingers like this, and that fits well with the rustic nature of everything, but I want to kind of make these look like they're part of the the whole picture and not a ding because somebody mishandled the piece. And rather than routing these corners uh, with a round over bit of some sort, I decided to use a spoke shave or draw knife, I mean, to kind of even things up. Because it gives a more kind of rustic look to it all and not so refined as if I did this with a router. So I just kind of go through and uh, put some random shaves on there, different things to kind of make it all look like it's just part of a beat up old post. And at the same time, uh, I'm easing that, you know, so somebody bumps an elbow into there and they're not hitting a sharp corner, they'll hit uh, this instead. So it um, just gives kind of a, a look that matches the rest of the thing. Um, along the way and any any chips that are in the beam from handling anywhere through its life uh, they now kind of blend in with everything else. Some of you have seen the video I did showing how to make these pyramid caps or pyramid plugs. Uh, the square ones go in here and the rectangular ones uh, go in these mortises over here and in fitting with that or carrying that theme through. I want to um, put a little character on the top of the post uh, as well as on the ends of these tenons so that it all kind of has uh, a flow to it, a, a continual look. So at this time, I'm going to add that bevel uh, to the top of these posts and I'm not bringing it to a point. I'm just shaving a little bit off to take down these square corners. And this is just easier to do uh, before I finish peeling those corners. And I'm matching the same 15 degree angles on these tops as I did on these caps. And I can get that quickly and easily with my little Makita Tinker Toy saw here by setting this to 15 degrees. Got enough blade depth setting there, I think. And I just follow that line I scribed around the top of the post. And that quickly puts a nice faceted little bevel on the top of the post. And as long as I'm here with this close-up shot, I want to show you how I textured these. And I could sure texture them with this monster, but it's kind of smaller detail work and this tool can really take off when it hits sharp corners. So I just downgraded to a, a stiff knotted wire cup uh, brush on a handheld angle grinder here. And I'll just kind of age this top while the camera is set up in this position. Probably a good idea to get a clamp so that the work doesn't run away from me here. You can see that it's really important to pay attention to what direction the wheel is spinning and the position of the tool because it quickly and aggressively catches sharp edges. And my form while doing this isn't the best because the camera's in the way where I really need to be standing to do this in a manner that's a little more controlled. But you can see that after just a minute, all the saw cut marks are buffed away and the contour of this end grain looks weathered and will match the texture on the rest of this post when it's done. And with the top end of the post taken care of, I'll continue with the draw knife, shaving and sculpting the other three corners of this post. And anyone that's ever worked with a draw knife on rough, knotty timber like this understands the challenges of working with multi-directional grain while trying to create a realistically random textured corner in the process. The knots in cedar can be particularly opinionated and pose a challenge even with a sharp draw knife. And what many would call just a hack job should do nicely in creating the rough sun look for this post.
And I think that'll do it for this post on these corners. And even though I plan to just breeze through this video, I'm going to end up doing a fair amount more editing on it than I planned. But I hope you can see that uh, there's a lot of range of options and a lot of different techniques you can use for achieving different uh, special effects on wood like this. And having these tools and techniques in your arsenal, I think will help you accomplish pretty amazing results for whatever project you're working on. This face of this beam has pretty good texture on it, so the main thing I want to do here is clean up these dark marks. So I'll show you what that looks like and not bother with uh, a whole bunch on the rest of the post. Uh, but the other thing I want to show you is that I'm treating these corners with the Restorer as well and not the little uh, cut brush because I want a linear action like this, not a cross grain action like I'd get with that other thing. So I'll just zoom in and show you what those two steps look like. First I'll do the corners and I just use kind of a quick heavy pass because I don't want to take out all the little bevels and facets from the draw knife process. But I do want to take the sheen off the wood so it looks weathered. And it's steps like this where I think the configuration of this Eastwood Restorer really has the DIY versions and that big Makita beat because it's highly maneuverable and I can guide it along the faceted edges of these corners with minimal effort and perfect results. On spots like this where chips in the wood run the opposite direction, I flip the piece end for end and I approach this going the opposite direction to give that restore tool a chance to pull flakes and chips like that loose so that the end result is more user friendly. And it barely takes a lick for this machine to do the job. Now with the corners taken care of, I can concentrate on the face and use the restorer with heavy pressure on a low RPM to pull those burn marks or iron stains out of the face of this texture to clean up the post and make it a little bit more civilized. You can see in a glancing beam of a flashlight how nicely that texture is restored in the process of removing those dark smudges. And it takes just a few minutes to clean up the rest of the face of this post so that it's clean and uniformly irregular. And now I can rotate the post 90 degrees and deal with the texture on this face. And I'll show you a couple things about that as I get into it. And I think you can see in this camera angle, this is the face that I want to texture, but it's pretty smooth. And out of all the faces on all the posts on the bed, this is kind of the only one that has these circular saw marks where most of them are either rough textured wood or they have these bandsaw marks going across it like this. So I want to show you how I can recreate this kind of look on a face like this. There's plenty of ways to recreate that bandsaw texture and one of them is certainly using a bandsaw. If I had a mile of this stuff to do I would set up something on the bandsaw and just push these pieces backwards against the edge of the bandsaw blade to recreate that. But because these posts are unwieldy and hard to manage and I don't really have that much of it to do, uh, I'm going to use alternate methods on this one. And one thing that you're probably expecting is the big box handsaw and I can use this for sure to create um, marks across here like that. That's not a bad way to do it at all. And if I didn't have another method, that's what I would choose. But there is a quicker and better way, one that I saw uh, some other YouTube content creators um, using for creating a rough sawn texture. So rather than reinvent the wheel, I'll just use the wheel somebody else created. Uh, I've got a sawzall here and a nasty rough blade on it. And I'll just use that to create those texture marks in here. And that's pretty much all there is to it. You can use this uh, more or less aggressively. I like to use a little more aggressively for this project in that I'm pushing the blade into the work so it kind of cuts in and makes these irregular marks. But you can get a smooth texture by just dra dragging it smoothly and slowly backwards depending on the degree of texture and the type of wood you're using and the type of blade you're having uh, that you have, etc. But that's basically the process I'll use on the whole face here to create that texture. And then we all know that the Restorer tool will work on weathering the grain out. I am going to use my Oops Eraser to re erase some layout marks for these tenons. 
because the eraser takes those off, whereas the uh, cutting tool takes a lot of digging to just to get out a simple pencil mark. So that's all good there, and I can show you a little more of what this texturing process looks like. Naturally, I use a bit of caution around the mortises so that I don't overdo the texture somewhere I don't want it overdone. And this is one of those things that's more difficult than you'd think to make it consistently inconsistent and not patterned or repetitive. And here's a close-up of what that texture looks like after less than two minutes of texture work on the face of the post. And I think that's pretty tough to argue with that that looks like a bandsawn surface. But now I'm going to hit it with the Restorer to complete the look for the weathered texture surface that we're after. I think you can see the efficiency and effectiveness of this tool makes it well worth the investment if you've got any volume of this sort of work to do. And compared to doing it with some method by hand or with lesser tools, I think Henry Ford's quote that says, if you need a tool and don't buy it, you'll pay for the tool and not have it, really applies. Because the productivity of this tool is absolutely amazing and is the perfect thing for this project. And I want to point out a little thing that I learned uh, about using this tool on this project so far. I mentioned earlier how this wheel will grab a straight edge and just really pull the tool into it. And after experiencing that a few times, I was turning the piece around so that I was always going off the end of the piece. But what I discovered, I can get around that just like nothing by just angling the tool like this and still pulling it in a straight direction. That way the whole brush doesn't grab an edge at a time. And with a little bit of care, I can breeze right over sharp corners like this and start at the end of a sharp piece without the uh, potential or the same uh, likelihood of it grabbing the piece. And you can see what that technique looks like here around these mortises, where I'm able to texture right over it without the tool grabbing and destroying the edges. And you can see it here again on the bottom end of the post, where I'm able to start with the machine turning into the sharp corner, but keeping it from grabbing by holding the tool at a diagonal to the edge. Cleaning up the fourth corner and third face of this post is pretty much routine. And even though I'm not doing any scripting and less editing on this rough cut video, I'll still mention that there's links in the video description to Amazon for the tools and supplies I use here, along with other deals on Starbond products, t-shirts and swag from the shop, etc. I also want to give a shout out to patrons old and new that support Next Level Carpentry as patrons at Patreon. For anyone watching that's interested in supporting Next Level Carpentry as a patron, you should know that there's an extensive library of in-depth, hands-on content like this in a patron-only library there at Patreon that all active patrons have access to. So if you like this kind of video, this kind of content, and don't mind the unplugged format, consider becoming a patron through the link in the video's description below. Well, here's a little example of the whole uncut video thing. Uh, I forgot to mention that I use the same sanding and scraping process for the faces on these posts as well, for the same reason, to get rid of those extra splinters, uh, little slivers that are left behind from the restore tool. But it's the same quick process, just a quick sand and a quick scrape, and it's all done so that all the surfaces have the same look and feel to them on the bunk bed. And I'll point out here that it is essential to have sharp sandpaper and a sharp putty knife. If you got some old manky piece of sandpaper that's been used for sand and steel for two years and a putty knife that's scraped concrete, it's not going to get the effect on the wood. But with fresh sandpaper and a putty knife sharpened the way I showed you, it's really just that quick and easy to do all the surfaces on the post as well as the rails. As Chip finishes up texturing the last face on that post, I want to thank you for watching this video and to congratulate you for taking another step towards your own next level in carpentry. And I do hope that we meet up again somewhere along the way on your journey. Oh, you're still here. I thought everybody took off when Chip left. But being as you're still here, I'll show you one more little thing that's involved in doing this rustic texture and look on this bunk bed project. And that is dealing with the, the cross beams that go the top, uh, across the top of the head frames. And the process for dealing with the beam itself is just like you saw on that post. But I do want to kind of put a special effect on the ends here so that 
uh, the ends of these tenons kind of blended with everybody, uh, with everybody else on the bunk bed. So um, this is where I used the line that I scribed earlier before I took this apart. Remember, I used a half inch block to scribe a line. There's that line I was talking about, and this really isn't earth shattering, but it is one more finishing touch for a project like this. So I still set at 15 degrees, and I just use that as a guide for cutting a little pyramid end on this tenon. And that's what it looks like after four quick cuts with that little saw. I know observant viewers are going to ask about this funny looking little hole in the end of this piece. Well, that's a byproduct of the fact that I cut this piece down in half and re-glued it back together and there was this little void left over in the process. And I planned on handling it by making a f this funny little looking Z-shaped plug that fits in that hole just like that. And it only needs to be filled a half inch deep because the rest of this is hidden in that saddle joint. So I picked a piece with somewhat similar grain and cut it to shape to fit in there so that I can use a little dab of tight bond glue and a block of wood to fill that little thing. Just like that. Scrape this side clean. Something like that. And now I'll age texture this end in the same manner as before, keeping in mind that I only need to do a half inch of these faces. And I think I'll buy that for a finished product for these Montana bunk beds. So thanks for watching to the end of the end of the end and taking yet another step on that journey to your own next level.